one then. So let's see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. Pop up on the chat if you can't hear me. But this week we are continuing with feminist art and we will be going um, outside of the West because last week was quite Western centric, although we did look at um, lots of artists of color, African American artists, Native Americans. Uh, so even though I, we will go outside of the West, I'd have to uh, briefly go back to Faith Ringgold, who we looked at um, in the class next week, just because in light of everything that's gone on in America this week with the race riots and with the killing of George Floyd, it just felt like we have to talk about it, especially because it's just um because we just looked at african american feminism in the class last week so uh i will briefly touch on um ways to think about this at the beginning of this class so we looked at emma amos very briefly last week when we were talking about representations of beauty standards in um in feminist art and I don't feel like we dedicated enough uh, time to this painting because it is really um, unique it's one of the very few um, feminist art works of the 20th century on the subject of beauty that actually is inclusive of women of color because much of the critiques of the beauty industry were quite colorblind um, and didn't talk about women of colour at all. So this is a really unique work of art and um, we didn't spend enough time on it and also Emma Amos actually died last week so there have been lots of um, articles about her and she is just such a beautiful painter and it's really worth looking into her, um, her other paintings. She does lots of paintings of, of black people swimming because she's trying to combat the stereotype that black people couldn't swim which was quite common in America and still persists today so she really does the most beautiful um, paintings but the first um, the first image that I thought of uh, when I was trying to think about how art can help you can help people think through what happened with George, George Floyd this week um, was actually um, Norman Rockwell which isn't the usual um, thing that would come to mind because Norman Rockwell is a very famous American artist but he's famous for being like the total opposite of Jackson Pollock and Jackson Pollock like completely rejected the style of Norman Rockwell um, and um, they're often pitched as like total opposites. Norman Rockwell is was super traditional, super realistic in his painting and this is his most famous painting. It's like a Thanksgiving dinner, it's super American, really, um, what's the word, sanitized and um, like almost sugary. What's that word for when something is too sweet? Like his paintings are almost sickeningly sweet. They're so perfect. Uh, and he is seen as quite a conservative painter, um, conservative in the sense that he represents really traditional values. Uh, and lots of his paintings do have this very um, romanticized vision of America, especially, um, well, even of American police who have such a bad reputation obviously but what's interesting about Norman Rockwell is that by the 1960s he was really uh, inspired and moved by well and horrified at points by the civil rights movement in America so he started creating paintings that included um, people of color and started commenting not just on the romanticized reality of white Americans but on the um, on what was happening to African Americans in the country. So this is probably his most famous um, late painting. Uh, and it represents one of the, um, it represents a black school girl uh, walking into her first day 
in a desegregated school and she has to be escorted by these marshals because um, she's being uh, bullied and um, she's having tomatoes thrown at her by the uh, racist white crowds. So um, this painting um, has now become one of Rockwell's most famous paintings and it's such a contrast to this much older freedom from want painting. Um, anyway, this painting came to mind because it was then reimagined recently by um, a contemporary illustrator called Mina Liu. And um, the whole subject and history of this painting and this message is very relevant right now. And it's good, I think, to be able to understand what Mina Liu is referencing um, in this image, which I'm sure will begin to circulate more again now. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention Norman Rockwell. This is another one of his uh, paintings because um, he's such an interesting artist who um, really changed his mind about, well, he really changed his politics and uh, tried to use his art in a slightly different way. Um, so let me just check the um, comments. Saccharine, that's the word I was looking for, thank you. <laughs> so, um, okay, and no questions have come up, let me just check. Oh, someone's just sent me a really interesting um, illustration, well not interesting actually, that's, yeah, look, uh, this is a terrible image. Uh, this is like a reimagination of Norman Rockwell's painting. Um, and it says, the policeman asks, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the boy, uh, the black boy answers alive. So, um, so yeah, I think Norman Rockwell's paintings will, um, well, they have been reimagined in so many ways uh, and will you know, become more prominent now amongst the riots. So, um, and someone has asked who is Mina Liu? She's not very well known because she's an illustrator who works for a uh, magazine, American magazine that I can't remember, but this image of hers blew up at the time. So um, it may do again. So yes, um, I, We'll briefly touch on some uh, other famous American artists who have confronted the subject of racism specifically in America and police brutality in America. Basquiat um, is one of the most famous. Uh, this is from 18, nine, um, I think it's actually 93, not 83, but I'll check that. Um, and it's about the death of Michael Stewart, who was who died in hospital from injuries inflicted by the police he was beaten up and finally um kahinde wiley who um who is one of my favorite contemporary artists and he reimagines black people as religious figures or royal figures um and he's a super re hyper realistic um artist and we may come back to him at the end um, because the class should do this big loop, but we may, we may run out of time. So yeah, I just wanted to include some of that because there's so much art on this subject and it can help, I think, sometimes. There will be an article in the notes where I took the, um, where I took the painting from. So, um, We'll leave it there and maybe come back to Kahindu Wiley at the end. Um, but for now, let's talk about Iran and feminist art in Iran so that we can get out of the West a bit, um, which is always good. So, um, yeah, in order to understand the development of feminist art in Iran, we have to. Um, I guess, do like a brief history of Iran. It's always useful to go over. 
So um, there are two major dynasties that we'll be talking about. The first dynasty ruled from 1789 to 1925, so a huge period of time, and that's the Qajar dynasty. The Qajar dynasty was an extremely uh, modern, forward-thinking dynasty um, that increased trade and traded all over the world, um, completely changed um, traditional styles of dress and architecture and everything in Iran. Um, and the Qajar dynasty is actually very well known for its women's movements that arise, that arose in 1910 and 1920. So it was a really modern dynasty. Um, and it's actually often used the Qajar dynasty in Iran as an example of how Orientalism um, completely misrepresented uh, the, the Middle East or the very unspecific Middle East um, because the Qajar dynasties was one of the most modern in the world um, and certainly was nothing like uh, Orientalist painters imagined um, Persia to be. So after the Qajar dynasty, you have the Pahlavi or Pahlavi dynasty, and they ruled from 1525 to 1579. Um, the Pahlavi dynasty were interrupted in 1941 because the British and the Soviets invaded Iran together. And they replaced one member of the Pahlavi family with another. Um, and that's because they feared that the Shah at the time, the ruler of the Pahlavi dynasty at the time, um, they feared that he was sympathetic with the Nazis. And um, also all of this is always all about oil. So they replaced one family member of the, uh, with another. Um, and then in, I think it was 1951, um, the US, sorry, it gets confusing, which is why I really wanted to go over it. So in 1951, the um, Prime Minister of Iran at the time received the vote required from Parliament to nationalize the British owned oil industry. Um, despite British pressure, the nationalization continued. So this was really not in Britain's interest. They wanted to own the oil industry. And shortly thereafter, a successful coup was launched by the CIA to put a Western-friendly Pahlavi ruler in place once again. So um, the Pahlavi dynasty was interrupted numerous times by Britain and America. And this really began to anger Iranian people, especially those who were very religious and who had always been uncomfortable with the modernization of Iran, which had begun with the Qajar dynasty. Um, and they felt like their country was being invaded, even though their rulers, even though their dynasty had not necessarily been replaced. Um, and this really essentially triggered the Iranian revolution, um, led by uh, people who wanted Iran to be a traditional religious country again. Um, so this is the backdrop against which Iranian feminist art had to emerge, and it really helps to understand that. Um, I'm not a pure historian, as you can probably tell, so um, I find it difficult to explain all of the specifics of history and it's much more complicated than I've um, explained now, but hopefully this should be enough for us to understand the art. Um, because the question is like, what happened to women throughout all of this and how did that affect the stuff that they produced? Um, like I mentioned, um, the Qajar dynasty had some great women, uh, women's movements emerging by the 1920s and actually under the Pahlavi dynasties um, or the dynasty rather it was a great time to be a woman to be honest um, and in the 1940s you really had this um, burst of modern women artists in Iran um, to be honest more so than in other places in the world and one of them one of those artists who would become most famous um, is Behjat Sada, and she um, she is best known for these huge uh, abstract paintings, which I just love. Um, and this is a kind of zoomed in 
version of all the layers. So um, I wanted to start with 1940s Iran and, you know, help um, help people understand that it was actually a very um, liberal country and that um, women artists really excelled in this period and um, were almost like celebrities. Um, because, but the thing is, it can't really be considered feminist art, this, um, this type of 1940s, 1950s modern painting in Iran, because these artists didn't necessarily identify as feminist. You could put them in the, of, in the category of women artists, but they definitely weren't feminists because they didn't actually feel the need to identify as feminists at the time. And their work wasn't meant to carry um, a political message. Um, of course, it can be read very politically now um, because lots of women were um, trying to uh, disturb and like intrude on the very male dominated um, canon of modern painting. Like when you think of anything modern to do with painting, you think of Picasso, for example, um, or Jackson Pollock, who we've mentioned. Um, and there are lots of really interesting modern women painters who um, sometimes seem to kind of parody the um, the um, typical traits of modern painting. So you can read their work politically, but it's not feminist art. So we have to we have to move on to feminist art. But this is one of my favorite painters, and she's wonderful and it's really important to remember that before the Iranian revolution Iran was a great place to be a woman and a woman artist. So moving on to feminist art in Iran. Um, after the Iranian revolution of uh, 1979 um, it was Iran was you know, no longer a great place to be a woman and this change in the treatment of women is captured by a artist called Kave Golistan in 1975. And he was an Iranian documentary maker um, and photographer and he's known for his socialist politics and he always wanted to bring marginalized communities to light and really the most marginalized communities like this uh, series that we're going to look at this photogra photography series is um, about uh, prostitutes and sex workers in the red light district of Tehran which is called the Sharano Citadel. Um, this uh, citadel was in the middle of the was in the middle of Tehran in the 50s, 60s, 70s, which just gives you again an idea of how liberal the um, how liberal the country was at the time. And um, Kave Golistan went in and did these um, portraits of the sex workers there. And they're really interesting portraits because they are not stereotypical in any way. Um, and they're not really sexualized at all. And um, he provides a lot of context behind the women, like he doesn't just photograph their bodies or their faces, uh, so that you get an idea of um, their surroundings, uh, celebrities that they liked, posters that they had on the wall. Um, so it's a really beautiful and really quite radical series, especially for a male artist to be um, taking such progressive photos of Iranian sex workers. It's, it's an amazing series. But unfortunately, um, the, um, when the Iranian revolution happened, um, the citadel was immediately burned. And it was actually burned, um, tragically, uh, while the women were still inside and many of them weren't able to escape the walls of the citadel because it was an enclosed um, red light district. So it's, it's a really sad story. And um, this contemporary artist called Vali Mahluji uh, 
created this new artwork using Golestan's photographs and using newspaper clippings from the time and all this archival evidence to make a timeline um, that helps you understand uh, the foundations of the red light district uh, in Iran when uh, Tehran was a really liberal city and its eventual destruction um, after the Iranian revolution and all of the impacts that this had on women's rights and perceptions of sex workers. So this is a wonderful contemporary work of art and it was actually showcased in the um, Arnolfini at the Still I Rise feminist art exhibition that opened in Bristol. Was it last year? I'm sure many people um, on this group um, went to see it. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I really love this work of art. And Mahluji has written, um, he's written this small um, description of Golestan and why he wanted to reuse these 1970s photographs, which I'm just going to read you. So he says, Golestan's process of creation involved several years of study and research, long visits to the site of the citadel where he befriended the, re the residents. It took Golestan a year and a half to carefully compose the portraits. His meticulous observation and empathetic sensitivity to the individual subjectivities of the women of the citadel has produced one of the strongest photographic studies of femaleness composed in Iran. So um, that's Mahluji's take on Golestan's photographs, and that's why he was inspired to, um, to make this work of art. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a great example from the 1970s. Now, it is true that we don't have much feminist art, you know, installations, photographs from the 1980s um, because of the totally turbulent political context in Iran. Uh, but that should not be taken to um, imply that women artists weren't active um, in slightly different ways. Like we've looked a lot in this class at moments of political disruption when artists have been quite clever about the ways that they make art. For example, the surrealists, uh, surrealist refugees making, turning their playing cards into works of art. Um, so just because uh, women in Iran weren't producing things that could be displayed in a museum, it doesn't mean that they weren't um, fighting back in their own way. So uh, there's a gallery in London called the Daniel Arnaud Gallery, and they, I think right now, um, right now, or it just closed, but it's, it's still on the website, had a exhibition on contemporary Iran, and uh, contemporary women's photography in Iran. And I just wanted to read this quote that they have on their website because I thought it was helpful. So it says, um, the Islamic revolution's impact on women is often misunderstood and misrepresented in the West. The idea that women were totally subservient to men is not completely true. During the revolution, women were among those rising up against the monarchy. Some wore the veil as a symbol of resistance, while others used it to conceal leaflets and weapons. Though the word feminism was not welcome in the decades after the revolution, women were deeply politicized and sought their own invisible means of empowerment. Um, so yes, uh, we don't have anything to show for the 1980s, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not there. Um, in the 1990s, um, after um, the first Gulf War, the social climate became more liberal, and that was because of the presidency of, let me get the name right, Chatami in the 1990s. Um, and so you do start to get um, lots of feminist photography in particular uh, arising in. Iran. And it is significant that it's primarily photography as opposed to painting, because we're going to look now at how the Qajar dynasty um, transformed photography into one of the most important things of Iranian culture. Um, so we'll go on to discuss that here, because this series that you're looking at by Shadi Gadirian uh, is inspired by 
Kajar photography. Um, so let's just look at some of them here. I had to include this one because if you remember uh, when we looked at Orientalist painting in week, I can't remember which week, um, we mentioned that one of the things that people most criticized about Orientalist painting is the lack of newspapers. Like they never included newspapers in any part of the Middle East. Um, as if it was a culture that only read the Quran, which isn't true. And uh, so at this uh, specific photograph of a Iranian woman reading the newspaper is a rebuke or like a parody of Orientalist uh, paintings in the 19th century. Um, so uh, this, this series is huge, this Shadi Gadirian series. And um, the, all of the symbolism is, is quite different and sometimes easier to read, sometimes more difficult. But in these, for example, she's, um, she's refuting the misconception that there are no Iranian women artists because she's showing that it's women who painted these very elaborate backdrops for her paintings. Um, and she's really especially commenting on the 1950s with paintings that we've looked at at the beginning of this class um, to make people really remember that women artists had their uh, had their painting revolution long before women in the West in many ways. Um, so someone has just asked, is there a reason for the sepia finish? And there is, and it's perfect timing for this question because uh, we are about to talk about Kajar photography. Like I mentioned, um, Shadi Gadirian is referencing and inspired by Kajar photography in this painting series and in lots of her work, to be honest. Um, like I mentioned, the Kajar dynasty uh, transformed photography into a cultural, um, I don't know what to call it, like into a, a a cultural symbol really in Iran. So um, the first photograph, no, sorry, the first camera that was ever, um, that ever came, that ever entered Iran was actually gifted to Nadir al-Din Shah, who we are looking at in this painting and this photograph. And it was gifted to him by Queen Victoria in 1839. Um, and while uh, British photography at this point was quite stiff and quite traditional and quite boring, um, the uh, Qajar dynasty took up photography with a passion, especially Nadir al Din Shah, and they really transformed it into um, an art form, a publicity tool, um, like using it as we would use it today. Um, and probably one of the most interesting things that they did is that they valued photography so much that they started painting uh, paintings from photographs instead of from life. So often you get these um, portraits of Nadir al Din Shah where you have the original photograph and then artists were invited to work from the photograph. So the photograph was treated as the original artwork um so so yeah this is another example of that um of these like double photographs so um and probably one of the most interesting um kind of small paintings to come out of iran in the kajar um period is this one which is a portrait of Nadir al Din Shah being photographed. Um, so this became like synonymous with his name, really. Uh, everything that he did to publicize himself and the Qajar dynasty was associated in some way with photography. And he had a photographic series made of all sorts of things, and he was a photographer himself. And he really carefully uh, composed his photographs. And looking at these gives you a sense of the style that um, Shadi Gadirian is referencing. And if we go back to the very first ones, um, 
she puts these kind of Kajar backgrounds in and they may look a bit Western to you. Like they kind of look a bit kind of old fashioned French Baroque, but that's because the Kajar dynasty um, um, did a lot of, well, was very inspired by uh, Western furniture and painting and, um, and um, this is all seen as like a sign of its open-mindedness and um, modernization. And it's definitely not a sign of, you know, art historians used to say that the Qajar dynasty must have been culturally, um, like culturally self-conscious or insecure, which is why it was turning towards the West, which isn't the case at all. Um, it was just very cleverly pitching itself as a multi, like, well, globally minded uh, dynasty that took inspiration from wherever it wanted. So that's why she uses these uh, Western looking backgrounds. Um, and she also uh, holds these kind of symbols of uh, modernity, like sunglasses and hoovers and Pepsi cans. And that's because um, a lot of Iranian history um, talks about this clash between the past and the present tradition and modernity which is the, the clash that kind of caused the Iranian revolution and it's uh, something that's always been um, grappled with in Iran because like I said the Qajar dynasty um, had was so uh, modern and managed to make this blend of tradition and modernity and blah 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 so that's what um, Gadirian is referencing by making these juxtapositions. So I love this uh, photography series. And one of the um, things that I like about it is that it isn't really about religion. Um, I think there is this uh, misconception that um, feminist art in the you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, coming out of the Middle East, um, I think in the West we have this misconception that it must be always grappling with religion and that um you know we've talked a lot in this class about the the whole idea that muslim women must have been oppressed and they must be producing art to you know shun all of their religious um traditions and it's really not the case in this in this series um she references many many things and she's not that interested in religion she just depicts um religious um garments as a part of women's life. So, um, so yeah, I love this series. We'll look at one more series from Iran, which is um, a contemporary, uh, a contemporary feminist photographer called Shirin Ali Abadi. Um, so, lo lots of contem more contemporary feminist uh, photographers have been inspired by Gadirian's work. I'm just gonna have to let my cat in. I don't know if anyone can hear meowing, but it's gonna get really loud. So. Hang on. Sorry about that. She's very needy. Um, so yeah, this is Ali Abadi who has like continued the tradition of feminist photography in Iran. Um, this is a photography series of, um, it, well, it's a series of four called Girls in a Car. And what I most love about it is that it's not posed at all. So she just took these four photographs, and this is the most famous, um, when she was actually going to a party with her girlfriends. Um, and then she turned it into this work of art um, because uh, she wanted to combat the idea that I just mentioned that Muslim women are oppressed and that they don't go out and have fun and you know um so she shows them here um wearing makeup getting dressed to go out and driving to a house party so I really love this sorry my cat is going crazy come on just be nice <laughs> um so so yeah uh, the final work that I will talk about by um, Ali Abadi and by any uh, contemporary feminist artists in Iran is this one, uh, which is called Hybrid Girls. Um, and 
it's about uh, the pressure for Iranian women to um, look Western. Um, the obsession with blue eyes and the obsession with blonde hair. Um, and the title, Hybrid Girls, uh, references this historical issue in Iran that we've mentioned with the Qajar dynasty and that we've mentioned with Ghadirian's work about the clash between the desire to quote unquote modernize <laughs> oh my God. and the desire to remain um, like true to your traditional roots. So that's what this um, series is about. And I'm just going to read a um, what the artist herself says about this, um, about this work of art. So this is a quote. In this series, the question is raised, certainly, about whether these women, with their obsession for the looks and lifestyle of Western consumer societies, are merely exchanging one form of imprisonment for another. Um, so this is a really interesting series, and I wanted to finish this section on Iran by putting together these three images that we looked at um, uh, last week and this week. The first image um, is German, the second image is African American, and the third image is Iranian. And it's just to show you that um, despite different um, cultural uh, backgrounds, women, lots of women have engaged in um, like the subject of the beauty industry. Um, it's a really important subject of feminist art, but it affects it affects different women very differently. So it kind of shows you how uh, one theme in feminist art um, doesn't necessarily have one answer. Um, and depending on your cultural, national background, you'll approach it in different ways. So um, this I think is an interesting comparison between three takes on, um, on the beauty industry. So yes, I am. Um, I I hope this has been a okay brief introduction to the history of um, to the history of feminist art in Iran. I'm just going to check briefly if anyone has any questions before we move on to the next bit. Um, yeah, some people are saying that this similar um, this idea of the hybrid girl exists in uh, many different continents. Um, outside of the West, which is certainly true. Let me check the WhatsApp. Okay, no questions so far. Um, so this is Iran and I was, I wanted to um, go somewhere else as well. And um, I wasn't sure which country to do. And uh, I ended up picking Mexico because we've talked about Mexico a lot in this class. Um, it's a, subject that I, well, contemporary Mexican feminist photography is a subject I know quite well from my master's. So um, I'm going to give you like a fast introduction. Obviously, this is has nothing to do with Iran. And I'm going to have to get rid of my cat, say hello and goodbye, because she's being too needy. If you hear incessant meowing I'm sorry <laughs> um so yeah so Mexican you know what happened in Mexico with the feminist art movement is completely different to what happened in Iran and there is no relation here other than they are two countries that don't fit the traditional western feminist art history um but I think it's good to finish with something a bit different so that you get an idea of um of um how limited the traditional history of feminist art is because it really took a different route in every country and every region. So um, the feminist art movement in Mexico really blew up in the 1970s, much like the American art movement. Um, but in order to understand the feminist art movement in Mexico, you really have to go back to the Mexican Revolution in 1910. Uh, during the Mexican Revolution, women were basically, um, women were basically, uh, where's my nice photo gone? I think it's here. 
here it is. Uh, women uh, had a huge role to play. They were called the soldaderas, like the women soldiers. Um, and they fought on the front lines, sometimes disguised as men and sometimes not. And um, by the time the Mexican Revolution finished, many women had actually joined the uh, communist movement in Mexico, which was the first official communist party developing outside the Soviet Union. And um, it's because they, they really thought that communism would would save would would save them and provide them with the rights that they now felt entitled to because they literally had proved themselves on the front lines. Um, but the Communist Party didn't win the revolution in Mexico, and the party that did win, which was the Partido Nacional Revolucionario or the PNR, like the National Revolutionary Party, I think um, it would be translated. I think. Um, it became um, very anti-communist and actually really suppressed the uh, the communist party. Uh, so you had some women who were aligned with the PNR who'd won the um, revolution and some women who were communists. Um, and if you are interested in this um, subject, then it's really worth looking at the work of Ana Victoria Jiménez, because she was a communist in the 1940s and 1950s. And then in the 1960s and 70s, she decided she wanted to join the feminist movement and she kind of bridged the gap between the two divides that women had fallen into. Um, and the reason why she kind of lost faith in the communist movement that some women had been you know, so connected to is because she thought that um, it was putting too much pressure on women to um, fit a traditional role of motherhood, um, which was quite typical in communist parties and communist political theory, this idea that women's social role was to have children. And one of the first protests that Ana Victoria Jiménez went to was this protest, um, which was held on Mother's Day in Mexico. And it was asking, we are mothers, but what else? And this poster is actually uh, taken from Ana Victoria Jiménez's archive um, because she, um, yeah, she had, um, she like collected every pamphlet from every protest that she went to. So um, she joined the feminist movement after, you know, spending years as a communist and went to many, many protests, which I've documented here, one against Mother's Day, one against the Miss Universe protest in Mexico in 1978. She made this series of photographs of uh, Mexican women doing house chores. Um, this is a nopal, which is a Mexican cactus. So um, she's really showing that this is specific to Mexican women. And I thought this was important to include given what we said last week about um, white Western feminism and domesticity. This is a, a good example of um, women tackling domesticity outside of the West. Um, and yeah, she, she, you know, took the mickey out of politicians and diplomats and she was incredibly um, politicized, especially when it came to abortion. Um, but she didn't completely leave behind her communist roots and she always remained slightly skeptical of feminism and you know and the word feminism and there's an interview where she explains that it's because she thought feminism was too associated with America and she was too scared of American imperialism and she worried that feminism was just another imperial ideology being imposed on Mexico by the US. So she did join the feminist movement, but she had these really important communist roots that you, you can't really understand Mexican feminism without understanding how hopeful Mexican women had been about communism and how difficult it was for them to let go of, um, of you know, of communism and turn towards something that they thought was maybe a little bit more American. Um, so yeah, this is Ana Victoria Jiménez. This is one of my favorite um, photographs that she took at the abortion protests. 
And um, it's interesting that someone has just asked or commented rather that Mexico was dominated by Catholicism because this is a very good point that we're about to come on to. Uh, another one of the things that makes the Mexican feminist art movement different to the American feminist art movement um, is the influence of Catholicism. So we are now looking at um, an event that Ana Victoria Jimenez photographed in 1984 called La Quinceañera. And she took all these photographs that were like parodying, you know, women dressing up for this big event because La Quinceañera is um, the celebration in Mexico when a, a girl turns 15 and she typically dances with her father and her father prepares to pass her on to another um, man in her life. So Ana Victoria Jimenez thought this was a really um, <clears throat> patriarchal celebration and she took this series of photographs where she turned the um, most important saints associated with La Quinceañera upside down to kind of um, parody them. So it's a really good um, series. And I just wanted to finish, I suppose, by, you know, talking about religion a bit, because um, like Ana Victoria Jimenez, many uh, Mexican uh, feminist artists and Mexican American feminist artists have gone on to, um, play with Mexico's religious um, history. I know, yeah, with Mexico's religious history. Um, and you can see this here with Yolanda Lopez. And Yolanda Lopez specifically reimagines the figure of La Virgen de Guadalupe, the Guadalupe Virgin, um, who is a really, really important uh, religious figure in Mexico. And I will quickly read you her story to finish the class. So basically, in 1931, shortly after the colonization of Mexico by Hernán Cortés, which we've covered in our class previously, a virgin appeared in a vision to the native Mexican Juan Diego on Tepeyac Hill, now in Mexico City. This virgin spoke to him in Nahuatl, which was the language of the Aztecs, and she asked him, am I not your mother? A church was built in her honor and she was named the Virgin of Guadalupe. Spaniards were originally skeptical about the natives' worship of the Virgin of Guadalupe because they worried basically that many natives were confusing her with Donantzin, which translated as our mother in Nahuatl, which um, was an Aztec goddess. So they worried that uh, native Mexicans were uh, seeing her as an Aztec goddess as opposed to a Catholic saint. Um, but nonetheless, they eventually accepted the Virgin of, Guadal of Guadalupe. Um, and often she's portrayed in Mexico as, um, she's called the Indian Virgin and she's portrayed with darker skin. Uh, so she's a really interesting figure uh, because she fuses uh, different religious um, traditions and she comes out of the colonial context. Um, but she's also seen as a figure who really helped Native Mexicans in their time of need um, at this very uncertain time for them. And that's why Mexican-American artists um, have, um, have now turned to the Virgin of Guadalupe in order to help them at their time of need. So when the civil rights movement was happening in the 60s and 70s in the US, and they were searching for ways to connect, well, you know, Mexicans in America were searching for ways to connect with their, um, with their heritage. They turned to the Virgin of Guadalupe as like a symbol of empowerment for them. And they made all these different reimaginations of her, um, where they dress her up as an Aztec goddess, um, or where they make self portraits of themselves as the Virgin of Guadalupe. This one on the right might remind you of the symbolism of the Mexican flag, which we've talked about in another class. Um, and they show the Virgin as this really active figure, um, which is, you know, in contrast to her usual, you know, calm passiveness. Um, or they show her as a working class woman. This is Yolanda Lopez's mother. This is a portrait of her mother um, sewing the cloak of the Virgin of Guadalupe because she always has 
a blue starry cloak. Um, and there've just been, you know, so many different feminist reimaginations of this religious figure in Mexico. I've just got tons of them here. And this one's particularly interesting by Esther Hernandez uh, in America. Well, she's a Mexican American artist. Um, because um, it's it's about um, anti-immigration policies in Mexico, and um, and it says that well, if you zoom in, you can actually see. So that it says, for 160 years, La Virgen de Guadalupe has accompanied countless men, women, and children illegally into the USA. She's given limitless aid and comfort to unidentified suspects at their time of death especially in desert areas near the US slash Mexican border. Um, and it portrays her as this wanted criminal. So that's just to kind of show you why um, La Virgen de Guadalupe has become important, not just for feminist artists in Mexico, but also for feminist artists um, of Mexican American heritage who are looking for this supportive figure or trying to reimagine this supportive figure in their context um so yeah this is mexico and iran and we've done lots of different types of um of feminist art i suppose now in this class um and also touched on the subject of religion um and it's important to say that you know we looked at western feminism last week and one of the issues is that Western feminism was very secular, like it was very much trying to break with religion, uh, which it seemed it deemed really patriarchal. Whereas for um, many women outside of the West, religion was actually a really important part of their culture, their identity, and something that they enjoyed and didn't necessarily find oppressive like Western women had. So they didn't really resonate with secular western feminism and religion does tend to come up much more as a feminist issue not necessarily in a derogatory way in non-western feminist art so yes i am um, I'm, I'm obsessed with representations of the virgin in feminist art and i have loads of examples here that you'll see on the powerpoint this is one that we've looked at in a previous class by Renee Cox, uh, African-American artist commenting on the um, death of African-American young men at the hands of the police. So it's, you know, really the ultimate artwork for this week. Um, so the Virgin does come up in the West as well. Like she's a, a really important feminist. Well, she's a really important icon of feminist art, really. And she's been imagined a million times in different ways. Um, and I thought it would be nice to kind of, you know, even though we've finished with the Virgin in Mexico, I think it's nice to finish today with some African-American art, which is where we started. Um, so I suppose this is just here to show you that African-American artists have also uh, reimagined uh, religious figures as uh, black women. And this is Harmonia Rosales. And Kahinde Wiley, who we started with, is a really uh, good example of this because, uh, I mean, he's very famous. I put this in so you can see if anyone recognizes his work. He's very famous because he did the Obama portrait. Um, but his other works are amazing. And he, um, he's really inspired by like Renaissance religious paintings. Um, and I just wanted to give you a sense of scale as well of how big his artworks are. And they're super realistic and super impressive. So um, I consider Kahinde Wiley a feminist artist as well um, for many reasons. So let's finish there. <laughs> it's been um, lots of information, um, a hopefully more or less comprehensive um, explanation of feminist art in Iran and then a very different story of um, feminist photography and protest and divisions in Mexico. Um, so 
you know, and then also intertwined in this class, lots of references to African-American feminist art because of the week we've had. So if you take anything from this um, ton of information, I suppose it's just to know that um, even in the same country, feminist art will have different strands like African-American, Native American. Um, and to understand feminist art, you really have to pick a, a place and try and understand its culture um, because all of its feminist art will vary according to that.